Good evening, and welcome to the Marian Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Henrietta Toivonen, and I'm one of the Ad Fellows this year. Political satire is a powerful form of humor that can inspire people to think about the absurdities in our society and awaken citizens to demand change. But it can also lead to miscommunication and polarization and involves the risk of provoking hatred and even inciting violence. On January 7, 2015, the controversial cartoons published in the French satirical newspaper, Charlie Hebdo, motivated a terrorist attack at the publication's headquarters. The shooting resulted in the death of many of the journalists, as well as other staff and civilians. I was in Paris when the event took place and was able to personally witness how this, how this act of violence failed the city of light in darkness. In the aftermath of this inconceivable attack, dialogue about the limits of satire has reemerged again. Should it be an unrestrained form of free expression, or should there be boundaries that are not crossed? If this is the case, how are, how are these limits established, and who gets to be involved in defining them in our globalized and interconnected world? Ted Rall, our speaker tonight, is a widely published political cartoonist, author, and columnist. His most recent books um, address the politics related to Edward Snowden, the war in Afghanistan, and President Barack Obama. He has also done more unconventional work, including writing a daily cartoon blog from the front lines of the Afghan conflict. He has won several recognitions for his publications, including the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award, and has been final, a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize. Our event tonight is co-sponsored by, um, by the Center for Writing and Public Discourse. And as always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording is strictly prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Roll to the Athenaeum. Although the recording is strictly re prohibited, the NSA will provide recordings to anybody who wants it, so no problem. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Uh, it's uh, a little frightening to be here. Um, there's so many of you, and uh, I hope I don't suck. Um, so um, yeah, so thanks for coming. And um, I'll, the, what I, I'm here to talk about is uh, the role of satire in the digital age. Now, basically, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that and then show sort of how one cartoonist, me and writer, has uh, tried to respond to the dis digital disruption. Uh, and then uh, I'd like to uh, sort of have an extensive q and When I'm in the audience, I much prefer uh, hearing uh, the uh, dialogue between the uh, audience and the speaker than just the speaker, especially if the speaker is me, because I already know my stuff. And, um, so, uh, so please, if you have questions, uh, you know, make sure you, uh, I do definitely want to, I'm going to leave time for them. Uh, short speech, uh, long Q&A, that's my thing. Um, Aaron Magruder, who does boondocks, will walk up to a podium like this and just say, questions? Um, I'm like, you lazy guy. It's like, it's like, it's the best though, it really is. So, um, What's happened to satire, aside from the fact that cartoonists are getting shot in France? Um, they're also, um, when, when the uh, Charlie Hebdo shootings occurred, I tweeted snarkily, as I want to do, that there were more cartoonists on staff killed that day in Paris than are working in the United States in the states of California, New York, Texas, and Florida combined. And I think people were shocked by that statistic. Now, when I started as an editorial cartoonist in syndication in 1991, there were over 500 full-time political cartoonists in the United States, and probably close to about 1,500 syndicated comic strip artists in the United States. And, and what I mean by that is people who earned a full-time living with benefits just to draw funny pictures of the president or uh, animals. And, uh, so that was a good time in America. Uh, 
Those numbers were much higher 100 years ago. There were 2,000 editorial cartoonists working on staff at, at the turn of the last century in the United States. And there were a lot more print newspapers. New York City in 1958 had 26 daily newspapers. Uh, so just to put that into perspective, most cities had two or three. Uh, and so what's happened to uh, satire in the US, uh, especially uh, non-televised satire, is what's happened to print journalism and magazines and newspapers overall. Um, the digitalization has come in, but it's a process that, but in a way, digitalization is just a process that has affected the economic model that was already in a state of decline. Very few people are aware of the fact, for example, that newspaper circulation in the United States has been declining steadily since 1960. And that's long before the internet ever came along. Uh, when I was a kid, I'm 52 years old, uh, in the 70s, you started to see the decline of the so-called afternoon paper. Most cities had a morning paper and an afternoon paper. Uh, back then, if you owned a newspaper, it was like minting money. You didn't have to be smart. You didn't have to be good. Everybody read the paper. If they wanted to know when the movies were or they wanted to check out Garfield's taste for lasagna, and the, everybody read the paper. You had to read the paper. And when, when afternoon newspapers vanished, that's half, the, that's half of them. And if, even in the last five years, you can see the diminishment of newspapers. They've gone to what they call the small web. So they used, newspapers used to be wide. Now they're narrow and thin. And like they think we're not going to notice. It's like candy bars. And, and uh, so they're trying to cut their way to, pros to profitability. And that's kind of what they've been doing, um, throwing, uh, just, just getting rid of content. You know, so here you are now in the post-1990s era trying to compete with a, for with a forum that provides unlimited, up-to-date news and information uh, of, of incredible bro broadness. Uh, and you're trying to, pr to compete against that by providing less content. So of course, it's a snake eating its tail. It's a death spiral. And you're just seeing these, these old publications wither away and die. Um, it used to be that if you dropped a, a Sunday paper on your foot, you could break a toe. Um, you know, now they're the, a Sunday paper now looks the way a Saturday paper used to look. Um, there's just not much content there. Now, how many people in this room subscribe to a print newspaper? Okay, so that's why. <laughs> and uh, it's actually probably a little higher here than it would be uh, in most audiences because this is a, a college audience. Uh, and most people I know, including very uh, well-educated, well-read people, don't take a paper, especially anyone under 50. So you might say, who cares? That's just the way of the world. And that's a fair statement. Uh, but the problem is that, um, the, that the, this old model, and I shouldn't say it's a problem, but it's an issue. Uh, this model has supported an entire generation of satirists uh, and people who are political commentators who spent all of their time just thinking about how to make fun of the president and the system and to get us to think about things in a different way. So uh, in the 1970s, for example, you had a widely syndicated um, series of, of columnists like uh, Art Buckwald. Um, Buckwald is, is, of course, um, no more. But if he started today, he would not be hired by a single newspaper. He was in hundreds of newspapers. He was a multimillionaire. Uh, in the 1950s, if you looked at, at a list of the nation's highest income earners in Forbes magazine, cartoonists were typically among the four or five out of 10 richest Americans. Uh, Charles Schultz, but people like Milton Kniff, who maybe most of you haven't ever heard of, um, they made tens of millions of dollars a year in the 50s and, uh, 50s and 60s. Now, maybe that's excessive. Maybe you, know, you don't need to make $10 million a year in order to do a good job as a satirist. But you do need a certain minimum base income if you're going to just live and breathe satire and think about it. So what's happened? So let's look at the positive side. When I got into cartooning, uh, it, was, um, the, it was the late 80s. And breaking in was hard. Uh, I was uh, in my 20s, and I drew in a funny, weird style. I didn't. I, I had a cross hatching. No, I didn't do the cross hatching thing. I didn't draw in a metaphorical style, which was popular at the time. Uh, you know, ship of state drowning in a sea labeled debt. 
<laughs> like all that, like, you know, the stuff that's, that the onion makes fun of. All that stuff is, uh, you know, that was common. And like nobody wanted to buy my stuff. So uh, I had to become a guerrilla cartoonist. I met Keith Haring, the pop artist in New York City in the, sub in the subway. And he's like, dude, you don't have to, he didn't say dude, but he, he said, <laughs> He's like, Ted, you don't, you know, you to take your work directly to the people. And so I did. I would Xerox my cartoons and put them on lampposts all over Manhattan. And I got arrested uh, because it's against the law, apparently, and um, <laughs> kept doing it. And then, um, and, and so ultimately people, like I picked up, over the three years, I picked up 12 tiny little clients, including a poetry review in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and a which I missed that poetry review, and because uh, they went out of business. Um, and then the uh, and then a, a alt weekly in New York uh, called New York Weekly, which I missed because it is no more. Also, and but by 1991, I got picked up by a tiny little syndicated uh, syndicate, San Francisco Chronicle Features, um, and which was owned by the San Francisco Chronicle. And they took a chance on me and launched me in 40 newspapers. And and then after four years of working day jobs. I was a financial analyst. I drove a taxi. I was a computer programmer, all this stuff. Fi I finally made a living, right? And it was just enough to subsist. But it changed everything, because instead of doing this on the side, I was able to live and breathe current events 24-7, thinking about it all the time. And I was a professional cartoonist. I was no longer an amateur wannabe cartoonist. And it just completely changed my life. And it changed my entire approach to my work and it made my work better and I think smarter. And, it, um, and, and at that time, I had that comfort of knowing that um, if, the, if past practice continued, I would probably never have to ever worry about being good again. Because once you were, back then, once you broke through, you were in. Like you could really, really suck. And it didn't matter, like Ziggy, it sucked. And it was like terrible and it didn't matter for, for decades. I mean, the money rolled in. Like, yeah, I just knew like I'm safe now. Like this was hard. I, I, you know, I spent my nights in the tombs, but now I'm here. And, and so that was great. And then, uh, you know, I get one of those little discs from AOL and I'm like, what's this? And, uh, and within five years, it became really clear that content was suddenly going to be worth a lot less and that gatekeepers were going to be no more. And now it's really obvious. No one needs to be, to do what I do now, you don't need anything other than a WordPress blog. And, uh, and in many ways, that's really, truly great. Because when I got syndicated by San Francisco Chronicle Features, there were no African-American cartoonists or columnists or puzzle makers whatsoever working for that syndicate. Uh, and now there are lots of black cartoonists online whose work you can read, and some of it's popular. Um, and that was true. I mean, cartooning and satire was a very male, uh, patriarchal field. It still is, but it was much worse then. And now there are more female voices doing what I do. Um, and so that it's much more democratic. It's objectively more moral. It's better that everybody can have access to this. But it's created a there's a there's a problem with it, which is that. Everybody I know who's doing this, who's, um, who has this model, is read by very few people. And they've replaced print dollars, print advertising dollars with digital pennies. So they're not making any money. So for example, uh, there's Dorothy Gambrell, who does a webcomic called Cat and Girl. Highly recommended, very funny. Um, and she lives in Arizona. And she was very frustrated about the financial model of, um, of cartooning, so she posted a breakdown of her income on her website, and it was shocking. Uh, it's basically um, working like a dog. She was making about $12,000 a year, probably putting in 80-hour weeks. And now, that could be cool when you're 26, but when you're, by the time you're 36 or 46, you might want to have a family, you might want to live inside. Um, <laughs> you, and, you know, it's not sustainable. And I've seen like really brilliant cartoonists leave the profession there is, uh, because of this. So, you know, you 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 look at Americans love to think about free, threats to free speech overseas. You know, uh, a Syrian political cartoonist got his hands broken by Assad's thugs, 
And rightfully, we were all outraged, and we spoke out against that. And when my colleagues at Charlie Hebdo were assassinated at their, dra at their drawing tables, again, we were rightly assassinated and, I mean, ups <laughs> angry and appalled. Um, but, but now, uh, what, what, um, but what we don't realize is that the effect to our culture is exactly the same if professional satire goes away um, because of pure economics, because the, mod the economic model under our current techno-capitalist system somehow can't sustain it. And so, um, in a way, I, don't, I really, really worry. Not in a way, I really worry about what comes next. Um, I, you're looking at the fifth youngest at 52, fifth youngest editorial cartoonist in the United States. Um, the youngest is a guy named Matt Bors. He's 32 years old. He went with me to Afghanistan. Um, in terms of working full-time political cartoonist, there are lots of people doing cartoons, but full-time, um, professional, syndicated, blah, blah, blah. I can't, you know, when people come up to me who are 23 and say, hey, I want to become a political cartoonist, I'm like, don't. Just don't. I can't recommend it. It's suicide. It's just to do something else. And so who comes next? I mean, who's going to think about this stuff? Uh, you know, we're talking about an art form. It's not new. This, you know, there, there were political cartoons on the walls at Pompeii. Uh, the Assyrians had political cartoons. Um, this is a, uh, and it's kind of appalling that there are more political cartoonists working full-time in Zambia and Iran than there are each, than there are in the United States today. And this is just my little thing, right? But this is true about everything. This is about journalism. This is true about um, st all, all other, a lot of other forms. So we've got greater democratization, which is undeniably a, an improvement. But you've also got deprofessionalization, which is also a problem. So what do you do if you want to survive? The only way you can survive is to be a business person. And that's what I've been forced to do. And so I'll show some examples of the many things I do. I basically have five jobs. I mean, you know, I'm an author. That used to be a full-time job. Um, you know, there, there were people who used to, like Hemingway would only work from 9 until 12 uh, every day and uh, then kick off and go get drunk and like run with the bulls. And then, uh, you know, being a columnist used to be a full-time job. I'm a syndicated columnist. Uh, that's not a full-time job by a long shot. You know, cartoonist, freelance illustrator, graphic novelist, bunch of different jobs. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's like... Um, it's like the economy, it reflects the economy overall, where everybody's working multiple jobs, longer hours, and so on. And uh, it works if you're like me, and you drink a lot of coffee, and you have a lot of energy, and you're good at marketing yourself. But what about those who don't? I mean, that's a serious problem. And um, I totally have the answers not. Um, so, but, but I mean, I think it's important for us to raise these issues. And, um, and I think that Right now, we're sort of in a transitional survivalist mode. You know, it's like what we're going to do is we're going to sort of muddle along until something better comes along, because it usually does. And that's the only thing. This is like uh, I'm a skeptic of capitalism, but I, I've been around long enough to sort of see that usually when something is really stupid, it usually comes to an end and is replaced by something else that's stupid in a different way. So um, I am so. So here's, um, I'm going to show a few, uh, few of the things I've been working on, and then I'll throw it open to questions. And I'm really open, by the way, to anything about anything. So um, almost anything. But I, if I don't want to answer, I just want to answer. So these are, this is uh, my latest. Um, it's a graphic uh, novel biography of Edward Snowden, the NSA whistleblower. Um, I open up, that's George Orwell there, um, writing 1984. And um, this was a, a tip, this is a departure for me. It's my 19th book. It's a, uh, non, it's a uh, biography. I've never done a biography before. And, and quite frankly, I did this book largely for, aside from the fact that I thought it would be interesting, I also thought it would be a really interesting um, uh, way to make some money because er there had never been a biography of Edward Snowden before. And I thought people would buy it because of the topic. And so there's an economic consideration here that, um, that is important to, um, to acknowledge, I think. Um, you know, authors, artists, authors and artists like to say, like, think, pretend like everything's all pure. And, uh, you know, we just follow our, our muse. And our muses are important, but, uh, you know, we have bills to pay too. Um, so uh, this is 
This is uh, sort of an opening about 1984 and uh, how uh, the surveillance state that was um, painted, that was uh, created uh, under, in Oceania, the fictional world of, Oce of Oceania uh, in Orwell's uh, imagination. And uh, you know, everything, everybody's all, the government's always watching everyone. People in their apartments are, are seen through their TV, which is called a telescreen, where the government can watch them through the TV. Um, and people are just subjects. They're not really citizens anymore. Um, and it reduces them to something less than fully human. And um, as Edward Snowden showed us in the summer of 2013, uh, we do live in Oceania in the United States, even though very few people really, have, really are aware of the full extent of these programs. One of the, when I started trying to work on the book, I, I t trying to figure out a way to get into it, I was talking to people I met, oh, my next project's about Edward Snowden, and people were like, who? And, um, and I thought it was the most important story of my time. Uh, I thought it was a bigger story than 9-11 because it revealed the relationship between the US government and, its, and the people. And I realized that people didn't really know the extent of, the prog of these programs and how wide-ranging they are. So, uh, you know, for example, uh, the only thing that people are really talking about is the telephony metadata program, which is basically the stuff on your phone bill, like what time you called, where you were, how long the call was, who you called, where they were when you called them, and whether they were on a cell phone or whether it was a, a landline. Um, and so that's the only thing that Obama or a Congress have debated or discussed at all in terms of possible reform. And the defenders of that program, I mean, it's a, it's, it say that it doesn't intercept your phone call. And, uh, and that's true because they have another program that intercepts the phone calls. And then uh, the defenders of that program say, well, that doesn't record the phone calls. And that's true because they have another program that records and stores the phone calls. And the, I think people don't recognize how incredibly wide ranging this is. We're talking about every phone call in the United States by everybody in this room, period. 100.0% of all everybody's phone calls in the US all the time, 24 seven. But you're also talking about all your text messages, your voice over internet phone calls, Skype, even your Netflix streaming habits. The NSA complains that they are spending billions of dollars storing people's NSA stream, um, their uh, Netflix streams. And so, you know, you really, you know, it never occurs to anyone, they don't really have to store all those Games of Thrones, we just need the one copy. Um, and uh, so this sort of shows how a graphic novel can be used to explain, you know, uh, kind of complicated issues in a simpler way. Glenn Greenwald did a very good book called uh, no, uh, no Place to Hide the, about the NSA uh, revelations of Edward Snowden. And I love the book, but I think it could have benefited by more graphics, uh, from more graphics and, and to break it down. Uh, this was an attempt to do it in sort of a YA kind of way. Um, and uh, so, you know, you see this, these charts. Sorry for those of you in the back. That's what you get for sitting in the back. Um, you know, the teacher never calls on you, but. Um, so, yeah, and so then this is like, for example, the metaphor that the NSA uses about um, how previously, before 9-11, law enforcement was trying to search for a terrorist needle in a haystack. And now what they do is they gather the entire haystack, and they store it in a data farm in Utah so that they can sort through it uh, and at their leisure. Um, so if you've uh, got any emails that you lost or something, you can just call them and get it. Um, it's a courtesy. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of programs no one knows about. Like uh, if you have a smart TV, how many people have a smart TV? Not many. Whoa, poor college community. You got to, well, once you, so yeah, well, you'll, your next TV will be a smart TV. And a smart TV is a telescreen. It is used by the NSA to look at people in their homes. Uh, Snowden has shown us that. They also, he, there's a program called Captivated Audience in which the NSA can turn on your cell phone and you turn on the mic and listen to you in your home. Uh, even if there's no power on the phone, they can still do that with the residual power. Um, and then there's a pro program called Gumfish that will turn on the camera on your laptop or on your desktop computer and look at you in your home. So 1984 really, really is here. Um, there's Game of Thrones. Um, 
<laughs> so uh, yeah, so this is you know this is kind of what it looks like. It's an exploration of Snowden and his bi biography and where he came from and uh, why he did what he did. And I'm not going to get into all that. We can talk if there's questions about Snowden. We can talk about him. Le Snowden as le petit prince, because um, he was kind of naive. He was a like right wing libertarian, <clears throat> and um, before and in O2 he said that whistleblowers should be shot. So. Uh, the impetuate, that's the next book. Um, it's going to be about Mr. Sanders, who I interviewed last week in Washington. So I'm going to, there's another one of these, and I'll sort of just uh, get ready for your questions. Okay. Okay. All right, so um, I used, I do, these are just sort of some examples of like the variety of work that I do. There's short, for, short, these are, this is a short form comic for a website called a new domain.net that I'm full time at. So you have to have a million jobs, as I, as I said. And it's kind of fun because you get to work in different formats. Um, this would be uh, a, you know, by the way, my tasteless attempt to make, to make light of ISIS beheadings. Um, because in cartooning, beheadings are always funny, uh, by definition. Um, then this is, yeah, again, sort of a, sh this is a short form, like a single panel editorial cartoon, uh, again, about the war in Syria and how the US armed, helped uh, arm ISIS, and now we're fighting them with, they're shooting at us with our own bullets. Um, Obama walking down the street, like with, uh, you know, after he's, uh, after he's no longer president and how he might be harassed by cops. Um, this was uh, the, sh the shooting in, um, uh, God, it, it, there's so many of these police shootings, I actually forgot which one, this one. This is Ferguson. Um, so uh, yeah, in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, the cops uh, were, the, one of the things that the cops said was that, uh, uh, that they were not shooting everybody that they could. So that was part of their defense. So um, this, this is sort of the format. Uh, and then like, um, this would, then there's like long form editorial cartoons. These go out through syndication, um, so that multiple panels. Then uh, more short form. These are editorial cartoons syndicated. I was, <laughs> yeah. You see, when you, when you still laugh at my, your own cartoon, you're either crazy or it's a good cartoon, uh, or both maybe. Um, so two ISIS guys hanging out. These Americans have to be contained. If they get their way, they'll control the entire Middle East. It's their slick ideology. They think they're special. Their laws don't apply to them, the, <clears throat> which justifies their killing anyone they want. To be fair, we believe the same things, and we've killed a lot of people too. How are we any better than the Americans? <coughs> Drone strikes leave toxic chemicals. Beheadings are clean and eco-friendly. <laughs> to the jihad. Almost. So OK, so then this was like more serious. Um, <clears throat> at the table uh, before, the, before my talk here tonight, the subject of uh, must satire always be funny? No, satire does not need to be funny at all. Um, it certainly pays better <coughs> when it is, but here's an example of when it's not. Um, so that was the punchline you're supposed to laugh. Okay, um, and so uh, yeah, I'm just gonna sort of skip through a bunch of these because it's kind of long. Oh yeah, so this is to me another example of like satire can be anything. So uh, this is um, from the uh, Blue Mosque uh, photo in the, of the Blue Mosque in Mazari Sharif, Afghanistan, and it's uh, you know please off your mobile, and uh, you know even even in a war zone this is a problem. Everybody's on their phone. Um, so that's uh, be the three amigos, me and Matt Boris and Stephen Cloud, and we. So this is another example of a way I make a living. I do occasional war correspondency. I, in, I've been to Afghanistan a number of times, and uh, most recently in in 2011, and uh, we went native, sort of, and which turned out to be a bad move because uh, it turned out that we were arrested for being, uh, we, we were accused of being potential terrorists. Uh, better to just dress like this. Um, and then the, here's uh, the beginning of a book that came out of that. Uh, so books, very important part of, but you can't make a living just from doing books anymore. 
um, which is kind of remarkable. Even a successful book is hard to make a living. So this book started out with sort of, um, this is about, uh, it's comics journalism uh, from Afghanistan from 2001 to 2011. And it starts out with a history of the US occupation of Afghanistan beginning after 9-11. Um, and it, you can sort of see how it, even if you're, in, well, maybe if you're in the back, I don't know. You can, let, you can sort of see how you can use the uh, comics journalism form to show things that would have to be, might be kind of dull or hard to follow in prose, which I also work in, but you know, words don't look so exciting on a PowerPoint. Um, so um, this sort of lays out the origins of that war. And then this is a layout of a typical page. Oh, campaign posters from uh, the parliamentary elections in Afghanistan. Um, oh, and so you can do like funny things. There's humor in all sorts of things. So, for example, um, there was a, we we were fascinated by food in Afghanistan, and you know the occupation has really uh, influenced the. Um, Afghan food, and one of the things we noticed was that they, there were Afghan versions of American food, and we were fascinated by this, so I did a, a cartoon that I filed by satellite phone from there. No food gets more attempts at Afghanization than pizza. From toppings to condiments, the results range from strange to scary. So here you have uh, chicken with the bone still inside, lamb curry, fish in quotes, uh, according to both waiters at different restaurants, uh, random gloopy mass of red mystery sauce, and the frozen crust. And all Afghan pizza joints always provide you with light mayo sauce and diet tomato, tomato ketchup, because in the world's poorest country, you have to watch your waistline. And uh, we kept seeing this sign all over Herat. It's hard to take photos um, in Afghanistan because of cultural strictures. So, um, but you can draw things. So it was like one of them was, don't miss Herat's famous burger tube. And uh, so in every place we went, the bottom, the bottom bun was always poppy seed and the top was plain. And you'd, I watched them tear them apart in the, in the back and put them, and they were like, just like America. And I was like, no, not, not really. And they were arguing with me. Like, what do you know about this? <laughs> and I'm like, no, I, ate a lo I love hamburgers. Like, you're to and, and our burger tubes are totally different. <laughs> and, and, then, and then there was this uh, matter of the egg. Uh, this actually happened. Uh, you know, I mean, this is an example of like, the, the, the absurdity of things. Uh, I opened up uh, an egg, a hard-boiled egg, which is usually your hard travel protein guarantee. And uh, inside, the, I swear the shell was intact, I poked it and like these black like gnats came out. And, and I was like, I, t and so I guess I'd been like uh, there too long and I was like, do you think I should eat it? And, and Stephen's like, no idiot, it's an egg. And uh, there was like the hipsters of Mazar, which was a real thing. Again, you know, you don't get this on, t on uh, New York Times, you know. Um, there's uh, this how, of course, how most Afghans dress. Um, but there are actual hipsters in Mazari Sharif. Only in Mazari Sharif, not in Herat, not in, Her not in Kabul, not, certainly not in Kandahar. And um, there are these skinny dudes who, even during Ramadan, are hanging around looking all punky. And it's kind of like a punk 80s aesthetic, like members only jackets and like um, very tight fitting clothes. And they're like guzzling water right in broad daylight during Ramadan, like, you know, defying anyone to arrest them or shoot them. Um, kind of just, it's a weird thing. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so anyway, that's that. And um, for the audio, I'll, yeah, I'll go like that. Okay, so if anybody's got questions. <laughs> yes, sir. I have an Orwellian uh, Fourth Amendment question. Mm. Uh, page 43 of your book, you point out that even a turned off a cell phone is an excellent bug. I mean, it's a great tracking device. So, I mean, is it massive social ignorance? Why would the American people, with an, everyone with an iPhone, why would they consent to having themselves bugged and tracked? And I mean, where's the outrage? And my follow-up question is about uh, Hillary Clinton's private email server. 
uh, Snowden is accused of abusing classified documents. Uh, if there's classified documents on that server, I and mean, she's a secretary of state, she probably knew how to handle classified documents. A lower level employee uh, would be in jail. So uh, why doesn't she uh, get to be tried under the espionage as well as Snowden? So those are my two questions about the turned off cell phone and Hillary Clinton's private server. Well, <clears throat> I'll go in reverse order as I always do. Um, the, in fairness to Hillary Clinton, she did not deliberately leak classified information with a, a view toward um, to, toward publicizing it and exposing uh, these programs. So, uh, and then in not fairness to Hillary Clinton, when you're in charge, you get to do whatever you want. And when you're just a low level guy who runs away to Hong Kong, then you're a state enemy. So it's a, a nature of power. I mean, but, but both of those things are true. Um, I think, you know, why is there no outrage against the, uh, about the NSA leaks? Um, there's some, I mean, this book's selling really well. Lots of people come to my signings. People are interested, and the polls show that pe the American people are opposed to most of these programs when they know about them. But you said, why do they consent? They don't consent. They don't know. Most people have no idea. How many people here knew that, the, that your phone could be turned used as a mic? Much less than 50%, right? Probably 20%, if, if that, in the room, right? So. Um, this is, it's, a, it's not known. So you can't get angry about something you don't know about. And the media's done a very bad job of reporting these stories. Um, there's been no follow through at all. And uh, that's, again, goes to that print media thing. They, they've, you know, the media is always about trying to protect those in power. But you're going to get much less things like the, you know, like Woodward and Bernstein and uh, publishing of the Pentagon Papers. Now, not just because the, 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 the media is more in bed with government, which it is, but also because media doesn't have the resources to, to provide uh, journalists with long-term funding for investigative journalism. They just don't. So uh, there's, you know, it's pretty hard for, to go to a, an editor and say, hey, I'd like 14 months to work on a story, and uh, you pay me a full-time salary, and I'm going to have to probably pay for have some expenses and travel, and you will get, but I promise you will get one really big story from it if it pans out. Editors are like, uh-uh, like, no, no, we want you to blog five times a day, little little tiny pieces, just like BuzzFeed. That's how we make money, um, and so that's. I think it's a, I think it's a, uh, an issue of. Uh, in terms of the outrage aspect, I think people need to know. But I also think the media has been really good about kind, kind of teeing up why it's okay. Well, we already gave away our privacy. We, you know, everybody agrees to post their stuff on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Um, not really. And I mean, you know, face, no private company has ever put people in boxcars and shipped them to death camps. Only governments have done that. So it's a... Uh, you know, I, I think there's a, um, there's a lot of different reasons. There's no organized left in the United States at all compared to any European country, for example. It's, it's tough. But, you know, that's why part of the reason that it's good to do, to, you know, any opportunity to publicize this, like this book is one, is, uh, is, is you know, I think helps move the bar a little bit. Uh, yeah. Hey, thanks so much for speaking with us. Uh, I think my, my question's along the classic censorship versus where do you draw the line question. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when, you're, when you're making your cartoons, at what point do you say, no, no, this is too crazy, this might really hurt some religious fanatics and have outrage versus, hey, this is funny and it's okay to go <clears throat> ahead with this? Um, I'm a First Amendment free speech absolutist. I don't think there are any, there's anything that people should not talk about, write about, or, or care about offending people. That's just where I am. I mean, I'm an extremist in that sense. And, uh, but there's, been a, there's always been a debate in, uh, among satirists and among, in general and political cartoonists in particular about where to draw the line. Um, after the Charlie Hebdo shootings, uh, there, were, there was a discussion. Gary Trudeau 
of Doonesbury wrote a, gave a uh, speech at the George Polk Awards where he, he took the dead cartoonists to task to some extent for um, having needlessly provoked their own deaths by, these, by making fun of Muhammad in their work. And um, I frankly thought that it was appalling that a cartoonist of all people would take a stand like that. Um, you know, it, I wouldn't have drawn those cartoons, but only because I didn't think they were any that they were funny. But if you can, but it's like if you have a if you have something to say, free speech means nothing if you're censoring yourself. Um, you have, you know, it's like free speech is like a, to me, it's like a, a sports car. You know, if you're, I live in East Hampton and. Traffic's really slow, but people are really rich. They see Lamborghinis idling in 20 mile an hour traffic, and it's just a damn shame. You know, I can't afford one, but if I had one, I'd take it out to Montana and drive 140. And and it's like, it's it's the free speech is that way. I mean, you know, you should be able to pick up, look at any website or newspaper or magazine in America, and see a lot of stuff that's dangerous, outrageous, frightening, weird, but you can't. It's, everything's bland, and that's also part of the reason that they're not doing too well. Um, and I, I think that, uh, but that said, for me personally, um, and I think for many cartoonists, there is kind of a rule that you don't want to punch down, you always want to punch up, you want to speak truth to power, you don't want to make fun of the disadvantaged or the powerless. Um, and that's just, for me, just because it's not funny. But if you can pull it off, you know, it's kind of like, hey, I've always said, like, if you can pull off the best Holocaust joke ever, great. I personally don't know how, but, you know, you should be able to if you can think of it. Um, and I, otherwise, what's the point? I mean, you can, and you also, you know, everybody can get offended at something, you know. So it's, once you start worrying about that, you're just going to be paralyzed. Um, you know, if you're a Republican, you'll, your cartoons will offend Democrats and vice versa. It's... You just, you know, you just have to do what you want to do and let the chips fall where they may. Where I think what's really dangerous is uh, the censorship that happens when good or where interesting ideas never get the opportunity to be aired because they're, people are afraid of, of doing them. And I have to say, that's everywhere. I mean, any cartoonist will tell you they do blander work because they're worried about being fired or losing clients or being pilloried on social media. Um, first of all, thank you so much for coming. Um, I had a question you've kind of touched upon um, in your last answer, but in regards to your first, one of your first points on more people having access to um, this, I guess, job opportunity because of the more open access of the internet, at the same time there are less actual jobs. So my question is if there's greater polarization um, in the field because more people need to be more extreme to have a greater audience. More polar polarization in what sense? Uh, just in the sense of like having more extreme views or having more extreme mm -hmm. cartoons to get more traction. Yeah, I mean, I think what's happening is that um, culture in general and cartoons are just an example of this are getting to be more um, segmented. You know, I mean, it's like it's just like there used to be three or four channels on TV and now there are hundreds, um, and there used to be just a f you know a few cartoonists. Uh, in the United States today, there's only 18 political cartoonists who are working full time. But if you include all the web cartoonists, the people who are just putting up something now and then, uh, there are thousands and th tens of thousands. And um, what's happening is that, like, it's just like it's sort of the Fox News effect, where you know people who watch Fox News think that Benghazi is a huge story. People who watch MSNBC never hear anything about Benghazi. Um, and so there's, you have the same thing where there are people who only read a very small segment of views um, and those and for them they're like they want to read what what they agree with and so there's not a lot of cross pollinization so yeah there's there's more um, there's sort of more wild and crazy views and there's no one also with the lack of editors because people are just on websites uh, and promoting their work there's no one who's kind of serving and this cuts both ways there's no one censoring them but there's no one editing them so uh, if people say really crazy and stupid or wrong stuff, it still goes out there. And then peop a lot of people read it, and they're like, they think it's right or true. So it, you know, it's, uh, that's, just, that's just the nature, I think, of the culture. I mean, there's more books than there have ever been uh, every year published. There's just more 
there's more, there's more, even though print's going away, there's more sources, more cartoons, more everything. And everybody's sort of reading their own thing. So it's, you know, whether it's musicians or anything. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I was wondering how well you thought um, televised satirists such as John Stewart, John Oliver, Stephen Colbert, Trevor Noah, how well you think they're filling the void that's being left by the decline of political cartoonists in print? I am so glad you answered, asked that question. Um, you know, I would think that given that he took our entire profit model, he could at least invite us on sometimes, you know? <laughs> Um, I'm talking about John, but you know now Trevor. Uh, they, yeah, I mean, the um, obviously there's no denying the importance of Colbert and uh, and, and Daily Show in the in the cultural firmament. They're funny, they're great, um, they're interesting, and they're important. Um, the and you know I watch them. I think that what they do, however, is different. The fake news approach of ridicule is one limited thing in the same way that the onion is one approach it's fake news and that's there's a lot of different structures a lot of different ways to make fun of things there's the ball peen hammer to the middle of the skull my personal favorite um, then there's also um, sort of the witty end run that gets to, gets in the back way and uh, and sneaks up on you and there's a million other ways there's fake ads there's so many th ways you can do it. And to me, the Jon Stewart thing is just, it's really out of the onion, right? It's exactly that. Um, the Daily Show is out of that. And um, what disturbs me is that it's as good as it is, it's, it's almost so good that people think by watching it that they're engaged in an act of political resistance. You know, people watched The Daily Show during the Bush years, and they, were, they had a good laugh, and they were like, okay, that war in Iraq really is bad and that George W. Bush really is an awful president and then they go to sleep. And then, you know, they don't take to the streets, they don't march, they don't write letters to the editor, they don't do anything. Um, and it feeds into the apathy. So, um, and I also think it doesn't, you don't really see a lot of aggressive points of view in those formats. Those formats don't do well with, say, uh, you know, a strident communist like Stephanie McMillan, who's a great cartoonist, or a strident right winger. You know, they, it's like it kind of. Marshall McLuhan said that TV was a cool medium, and cool medium usually kind of trans translates to moderate, centrist, mellow, calm, dead. Af you know, flat affect the American way, and. Um, the, uh, and you, you, that leaves a lot of stuff out. You know, that's why like, part of the reason that our, you know, out of a huge ideology, you, you know, you've got two political parties that are really close together and, and that's relatively, even though there are differences, obviously. Um, but, not, but the rest of it's all left out. I mean, there's, there are polls these days that show that 35-ish percent of Americans think that socialism would be a better economic system than capitalism. Who do they vote for? What TV show do they watch? What cartoons do they read? You know, I mean, they don't. That's, there's like, they're left out. So, and there's other, I could make other examples, but yeah. Anyway. Uh, hi, thanks so much for your talk thanks. there. Um, you showed a slide at one point saying that your next book is going to be about Bernie Sanders. Um, I was wondering if you could describe what the process of working on that has been like so far. Thank you. Um, stressful. Um, <laughs> I've been on book tour. Um, so. Bernie, and also I'm really, really worried he'll say something stupid and his chances will go away and then I will not have a book to sell in January when it comes out. Um, so uh, yeah, so the, with Bernie Sanders, um, the key thing was to sort of get to, get past the fact that he's a, he has a boring personal life. Um, you know, he's unfortunately, I really don't think he has a skeleton in his closet. Unfortunately, there's no political journey. Like Edward Snowden, you know, he was a right winger who became a rebel. It's like Bernie Sanders has always been the same guy since he was a kid in Brooklyn. And uh, so I was like, okay, well, this is for a bio that's kind of dull. And um, and so uh, figuring that out, and then finally also trying to figure out what's going on with it. The, a lot of his personal history is really hard to research. And if I hadn't been able to, last week I interviewed him in person, and if I hadn't been able to do that, I think I would have been doomed because you pretty much, he's so tight-lipped about his personal life. So the process is I 
I uh, started working, I did as much research as I could and read everything I could about his past and his present and then compiled it and tried to put it into some kind of format that made sense. I mean, I, wanna, you know, I don't want to just say, here's Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders was born in 1946 in Flatbush, Brooklyn. Boring. It's like, why, does, why do we care about Bernie Sanders? Why is he interesting? And the reason Bernie Sanders is interesting is because here's a guy, he's the only socialist in Congress, right? Self-identified socialist. He's been there in, in public life for 40 years, always as the weird socialist in a right-wing country, and totally marginalized. And now, sort of after Occupy Wall Street um, and brought up the issue of income inequality in America, um, suddenly income inequality is an issue that's not going away, even if Homeland Security can make Occ Occupy Wall Street go away. So they, um, so he was perfectly poised to move, to step into the void because no establishment politicians were talking about income inequality as an issue. And so he, um, the, what his entire strength comes from having been marginalized. His credibility comes from having been ridiculed. And that to me is the Bernie Sanders story. And then, so it's about framing that and it requires kind of a prehistory of the Democratic Party going back to sort of how did it, the Democratic Party move so far to the right since like the McGovern defeat in 1972. So I kind of walk you through there and then uh, have a little bio like why he is the way he is and what he, what he means. And so it's not just about the person. In a biography, it's like, why does this person matter, right? It's like, you know, there'd be no biographies of Adolf Hitler if he hadn't done the things he did, if he just sold pencils on the streets of, of Vienna. So it's like, this is, this is the, I'm not comparing Bernie Sanders with Adolf Hitler, <laughs> Jesus Christ. So and it's like, this is not recorded. Okay, so anyway. The point is that, uh, and, and, I, I, and he had the, you know, and, I, and the interview really helped, and I incorporated the interview, and then, so then the, the script is written first, and then I draw, after, while it's being edited, I draw the pictures that go with the script, script, but the script, but that's my process. A lot of graphic novelists do it the opposite way. They think of images and pictures, so they would probably just draw a bunch of pictures of Bernie and his, his family, and then they would think of words that go around it. So there's cartoonists, there's cartoonists who are writers first, cartoonists who are, who, are, uh, who are artists first. And you've seen my art, I'm a writer first. So. Hi. Um, you touched on this, you touched on the apathy thing a little bit in the John Stewart question, but I was wondering if you could address, and obviously it's like a, you know, a big, topic without clear answers, but <laughs> at least your perspective on when and how political humor, whether that's satire or some other form, um, can actually affect people's political attitudes and political behavior, and what you think makes the difference between a political joke that just makes someone feel good about themselves or maybe changes their mind about something versus actually changes the way that they act as a member of a political society. Um, you know, I, I think it's common for political satirists to, or social satirists to say in these kind of forums, well, you know, we know it can't really change anything, but we do it anyway because we're crazy. And, but I think, but I know that's not true. I mean, there's an incredible passion. Um, you know, if you talk to a stand-up comic who's politically oriented or, or you know, any, I, I know a satirical poet. I mean, there's just any, anyone, you get up in the morning, and you foolishly really do think you might be able to change the world. Otherwise, why would you bother? It, it would just be, it's certainly not for the cash. So you're doing it to try to change things. And for me, in my experience, generally, like 99% of the time, if political satire works, it, it works incrementally over time at slowly changing people's attitudes and pushing the needle over. I mean, if you just think about the difference between the way George W. Bush was perceived uh, in the day after 9-11 when he gave that speech uh, at Ground Zero, which uh, I ridiculed as the steaming pile speech. Um, he, and, and like he had 90% approval rating uh, at that time. Uh, I forget if it was Time or Newsweek, but one of them compared him to Churchill. I'm like, Churchill, Bush, <laughs> Churchill. That was the madness, okay? The terrorists won that day. And so 
the, um, and so, and then by the time he left office, right, I mean, it's like, yeah, two million Iraqis were dead, but the thing is, that's not why his approval rating was under 20% by the time he left office. It's like, you know, he had been relentlessly ridiculed by Jon Stewart and a million, you know, other, other comics who made fun of him. He was ridiculed. He lost his, um, his dignity on the public stage um, by the satire. The people who made fun of the way he looked, the people who made fun of the way he talked. It's like, they're in their cave. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna smoke them out. Um, he, you know, he was, he was uh, and I think, you know, I'm just pointing at Bush because he's the most recent example, but uh, then you can look at uh, the contrast to someone like Obama who has really had it easy from the political satire class. I mean, you know, John Stewart is not hard on Obama um, compared to Bush. Uh, I haven't been hard on Obama compared to Bush. Um, you know, we, we've, it's been easier. And so, you know, he's like getting ready to leave office with, you know, his, the dip in his approval ratings, all presidents go through this, is not nearly as catastrophic. I mean, of course, it also helps that the economy got better instead of worse. There's a lot of other factors. but. He, you know, I'm radically simplifying. I'm a cartoonist. That's what we do. But it's, it's a, um, so I think the point is that it did make a difference. I mean, I think uh, when you're, you look at someone like, uh, I mean, it's, it's no one particular thing. I did uh, a cartoon one time that I think had an effect on law. And it was in um, Illinois. I did a cartoon about how uh, Walmart was not, uh, wanted to allow its pharmacists to not provide uh, uh, count, uh, contraceptives over the counter. And so I did a cartoon saying that, uh, you know, people should have the right to, obviously, their moral, um, their moral inhibitions. And if they don't want to uh, provide contraceptives to women, they shouldn't have to. But then women shouldn't have to drive around and uh, you know, needing a, a, like a morning after pill and not be able to get one and, and, and have to go through that big long line in the parking lot and all that. So there should be a big sign uh, on Walmart that says uh, no contraceptive services provided here. And uh, the state of Illinois legislature passed such a law and Walmart chained, and well, guess what? Walmart has contraceptives at all of their pharmacies in the state of Illinois. But that's like, that's a career that's like, I mean, you know, I've drawn thousands of cartoons that have never had that kind of effect. I can point to like three or four things like that. Um, so, you know, the, so my batting average is like 0. .00006. Anyway. Anyone else? Yeah. Hi, yeah, uh, thanks for coming. My Thank question you. is about your economic views. So the economy has provided a backdrop for much of your talk tonight. Mm. And I'm curious about your preferred economic system. Mm. So this talk, this is when the dinner turned boring. Um, sorry. Thanks for the question. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a lefty. I, I, I'm a socialist, uh, unrepentant. Uh, I, I don't think anyone should earn more money for doing an easy job, as is our system, you know, sitting behind a desk as a CEO, then they should earn doing a hard job, mining coal. Um, so I don't see any, um, I don't see any reason for there to be a disparity of income or a disparity of wealth. I think everybody, you know, we're all people and we should all get to live the same. Um, and that's me. I mean, I've seen, uh, I've seen uh, different systems around the world. Uh, I travel a lot. But uh, I don't, for me, I just could never get past the idea that I don't believe in the meritocracy. Like even the whole idea that like you deserve to make more money because you work harder, it's ridiculous. Like who's to say that working hard should be, uh, you know, should be like a, a great virtue. I mean, I work hard, sure, but it's like, so what? Like if you want to sit around and smoke pot, are you a worse person than me? Like no, maybe you just don't want to work hard and that's cool. I mean, and you should starve, why? I mean, I don't want to sit around and just smoke pot. It's like, I, I want, you know, I like working hard. So I'm like, why should I get rewarded to do what I like? And you shouldn't get rewarded. You shouldn't get rewarded for doing what you like. And then I don't understand the idea that like a smart person should make more money than a dumb person. It's like, well, I mean, it's, it's purely luck if you're smart or not, right? I mean, you, you're born smart or you're not, or, you, or your intelligence is, is like you get the benefit of education or parents who take care of you because you're born into a life of privilege. That's why you're smart. So like, you know, if you're, 
it, you know, I mean, look, Donald Trump's dumb and he's probably gonna be president. I mean, it's, and he's rich. And he's orange. So, our first orange president. Um, I don't know, I hope, I hope I'm wrong about that. Uh, yeah, but anyway, uh, yeah, it's, that's, that's, that's my boring answer. Uh, we have time for two more questions. Great. Please make them not about the economy. <laughs> uh, thank you for your talk tonight. Um, I'm curious uh, of your opinion on what some people would say is a little bit too prevalent in college culture these days, which is the idea of extreme political correctness, mm. uh, avoiding microaggressions at all costs, creating these safe spaces at you know extreme lengths, and uh, if that is really beneficial or if it's actually stifling conversations that need to be had. Well, I mean, I have a little bit of insight in, into this because uh, I went to college over kind of uh, in two periods. Uh, in the early 80s, I was at Columbia Engineering School from 81 to 84. And then in their great wisdom, I was expelled. And I returned in 1990 as a 28-year-old college senior, history major, much smarter. Um, and the and the thing is that uh, during that period, there were a lot of changes in the curriculum and uh, in the attitudes on campus. It seemed like that was the PC period when it really started. And obviously, it's gone. Uh, it's, it's developed a lot more since then. Um, but I remember, like, you know, I took some of the same classes. I had to because I failed them the first time. And, uh, and so for, you know, Columbia University has this core curriculum. So it's like, you know, the great men. And in other words, people who looked like me but with wigs. And they, um, and they were, um, and, and you know, so you, you kind of like, it's, I'm torn. It's kind of like, well, we're no longer going to teach Melville. I'm like, that's kind of too bad because he's really good. And then it's like, but we're you know, going to have Toni Morrison instead. And I'm like, that's cool. You know, it's like, I prefer other African American writers more, but whatever. But the point is, you could see the change. And, and it was like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a wash. And I really think it's one of those things, you know, for an opinionated guy, I really can see this both ways. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, it's really awesome to see non-white males and heteronormative people, able-bodied people, uh, you know, stepping up and taking their rightful place in American society, which is as equals. And um, it's long, obviously, it's 450 years overdue. And so that's great. And this is part of that process, you know? I mean, it's great for, you know, guys like me to have to think twice about what we say. Um, it can be a little exhausting, too, sometimes, because you're not always keeping up. And you see people get sometimes beaten up over saying something that really wasn't bad. Um, there, uh, there was this, I guess, that British um, scientist that happened to recently. And, you know, he was really, uh, if you fought, I forget his name. Anyone know? I remember. Um, he was, it was a big controversial thing. And he got misquoted in uh, social media for saying that basically, uh, you know, he didn't want to have any women in his lab because uh, he was risk falling in love with them, right? And, um, and he was like, oh, what a sexist pig. And he was thrown, he lost his, uh, his gig as a, as a uh, emeritus professor at, in, in, I forget which college, I think it's uh, some, anyway, I don't remember. Anyway, the point is, it was a big thing. And it turns out, you know, once you scratch the surface of it, that it was completely unfair. I mean, this guy was not a sexist. In fact, there were just a litany of female scientists who said that he was a complete champion of their work. He was f like the least sexist guy ever. He was promoting them. Um, his wife, he's a stay at home, like he, like his wife is like more prominent than he is and he stays home and cooks and, and takes care of the kids. So you know what I mean? He's just not a pig, okay? And, 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 just, and he got misquoted and, and then he's like, the guy's destroyed. Like they're not gonna take him back. It's over, he'll never be a scientist again. And that's frightening. And I know that's not, in the co that's not a college thing, but it kind of is. And um, so, you know, I mean, it's like any social movement. It can go too far. You can get, you know, you have a, a, French, a French revolution that overthrows the monarchy, which really needed to go, but, you know, you can get that guillotine can kind of work overtime. And, um, and I think that's just, you will see some of that. And, um, I, I think it's like really great to be sensitive, but I also think that people have to be able to have a wild and crazy sense of humor, or there's really no freedom. 
Um, so it's just, boy, that was the wishy-washiest answer ever, right? <laughs> just like, wow, that's so lame. I expected more from that guy. Okay, last question, thank God. Did someone steal the mic? <laughs> okay. Your Walmart uh, comments. Mm. I mean, perhaps the American people don't know when they have a cell phone that, that it's a bugging device, but, but Apple, Apple knows when they sell an iPhone, the, the companies know, but it's not a real big selling point to, to advertise to people when you buy a cell phone that, you know, you're being tracked continuously. They, they own your, you think you own your cell phone, but uh, if the government wants to own it, they do. Well, iPhone's actually a bad example because uh, since post Snowden, iPhone 6 series is now encrypted point to point. Um, so, of course, you know, it leads to the privacy haves and the privacy have nots. If you want 12, if you can pay $1,200 for a telephone, you can, uh, you, can, you can have the NSA out of your business. Um, and if you can't, maybe not so much. So I think that's an important distinction. Um, but yeah, it's a, uh, I, think, I think people need to be aware of this issue. And uh, I, I really do want people to think about it. You know, um, Glenn, Glenn Greenwald kind of gets the question a lot, you know, if, you don't, you know if, you don't have any, if you're not doing anything wrong, you have nothing to worry about. And he always says, okay, uh, could I have your email address, please? And usually people give him the email address because they think he's going to email them something. And he says, okay, could I have your password? And no one ever gives him the password. And I always say when people ask that question, do you own curtains? You know, do you have curtains in your house? And if you don't, if you do, then you must be an ISIS bomb maker. There's no other explanation because we are all guilty until proven innocent. So thank you, everybody. Uh, really appreciated the questions. They were great.